uh, I will now ask Sister Jessam to introduce our next keynote speaker. It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Michael McBain. And he's the national coordinator for the Canadian Health Coalition, and he's been there since 1995. Michael has 25 years' experience working in coalitions on issues related to Medicare, privatization, food and drug safety, and economic justice. He's the author of the Ill Health, uh, Ill Health Canada, Putting Food and Drug Company Profits Ahead of Safety, published by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives in 2005. Michael studied political science and theology in Ottawa and was a senior researcher from 1982 to 1990 on issues of economic justice with the Canadian Conference for Catholic Bishops. From 1990 to 1993, Michael was the national coordinator of the Action Canada Network, where he campaigned to expose the threats to society, democracy, and the environment posed by the North American Free Trade Agreement. And uh, Michael can be reached by email, and he welcomes uh, your correspondence, mike at medicare.ca. Uh, Sergeant Arms, please bring Mike up front. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joan, and thank you very much, Rick, for the invitation. It's a real honor to be here with the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor, brothers and sisters and friends. Um, I want to just use the opportunity to just to give you a bit of the state of play in health care, um, what's going on and what the Canadian Health Coalition is planning in terms of actions this fall and into the winter, and then to leave uh, lots of time for, for questions and some discussion. Um, we're coming up to a very critical time in healthcare in Canada. And as I was preparing these comments, I was thinking, again, it seems every five to 10 years is a critical, uh, critical moment, a strategic moment in healthcare. And why it's such an important time to be very alert, very vigilant, and to start to organize politically is because we're coming up to the end of the 2004 10 year accord on healthcare, which guaranteed adequate, predictable, and stable funding from the federal government to health care. And so we're coming up to a period of negotiation um, with a federal government, as you know, that is not known for its, its commitment to national cost-shared programs. In fact, the Prime Minister said in a previous election campaign that all taxes are bad. And that's a pretty radical statement especially if you care about social programs and Medicare because that's how you fund Medicare. So there's a lot at stake, over $40 billion a year in a federal transfer plus a 6% escalator. That's all, uh, that's all up for stake. There's two competing visions and guiding values about the future of Medicare in Canada. As Roy Romano said, one of the views is high on rhetoric and low on evidence and it's masquerading as something new. They love to use the word innovation. And it's based on the premise that healthcare is a business, that healthcare is a commodity to be bought and sold. I was at a meeting last Thursday in Montreal at the, the Royal Victoria Hospital, and I was shocked to see the people around that table, which include a former Minister of Health of Quebec, Philippe Cuillard, who's now working for a major private investment fund in healthcare. And another operator was Michelle Clare, who used to, who held up, who ran a commission in the future of healthcare in Quebec, who's also working for a giant for-profit healthcare corporation. Most of the people on the panel were working for private healthcare industries, and particularly targeting long-term care and home care, and making statements that the government has no business looking after seniors. This, you leave that to the market. So that's one vision out there. They want to get their hands on that $40 billion and more. They don't want that money going to care. 
That money is for corporate profit in their mind. But they're not alone, of course. You also have the Frank McKenna's. Frank's a big banker selling health insurance. And he's out there saying privatize health care. You've got Don Mazinkowski in, in Alberta from Great West Life saying privatize health care. You've got Michael Kirby. You know Michael Kirby? Yeah. He's from Nova Scotia. He's selling, of course, more private health care. He happens to be on the board of Extendicare, a, a giant a Canadian-based multinational which is in the for-profit home care and long-term care. There's a pattern here for the people of that selling that, promote, that vision of health care. They're all personally invested in it. They all have a personal financial conflict of interest. I like to call them actually snake oil salesmen. They know there's a lot of money to be made breaking Medicare. And that's why this is a dangerous, critical period leading up to the renewal of the health accord. The other vision, of course, is rooted in our narrative as a nation. It's backed by evidence and ethics, as opposed to ideology and self-interest, which strongly believes that healthcare is a public good. It believes that democratically elected governments upholding the rule of law, not corporate bottom line, should define common needs, provide equitable access to quality services, and at a reasonable allocation of resources. This view was shared by Tommy Douglas, Emmett Hall, and it's shared by Monique Bejean, Roy Romano. Fairness, equity, compassion, and solidarity. These are the values that were adopted and nurtured throughout Canada's history. So while the corporate sharks are, sharks are circling, and a Harper government in Ottawa is promoting public-private partnerships, and it's interesting that in the last federal election, during the leaders' debate, one of the only things that Stephen Harper said about health care is that he wants provinces to experiment with alternative service delivery. Now that struck a lot of ordinary people as, what, that's a strange term, what does he mean by that? It's interesting, Jack Layton jumped on that immediately and said, that's privatization. And if you listen to the tape, Harper says, no, it's not. So it sent me Googling to see what the definition of alternative service delivery was. And alternative service delivery is, by definition, privatization. Because what is the alternative? It's alternative to public. What's the alternative to public? It's, it's private for profit. So we have this real conflicting uh, vision of the, of the direction to take healthcare. Underlying this difference, I think, is a conflict of values. It's the values of guardianship which are captured in the Canada Health Act versus the values of a trader, a commercial trader on the market. These are two irreconcilable sets of values. And the Canada Health Act was set up to protect access to health services from the market. So that no matter where you live, you have a right to access to health care based on your need, not based on your ability to pay, or not based on the fact that you live in downtown Toronto or Vancouver or, or Montreal or Edmonton or Halifax. That you have a right in rural and remote areas to health care. That's a very, actual, actually it's a very socially radical piece of legislation to say we're going to protect this important service from the market. And that's, of course, grounded in, in very fundamental values. So those are the two conflicts, market traders versus guardians in the public sector. Of course, the guardians have a problem with the Canada Health Act. They're saying that you have the Fraser Institute and others saying, you know, we should, we should put the Canada Health Act on hold so we can experiment with the market. And of course, what they're saying is they want to open up the delivery of services so that businesses can pick and choose which services they, want, they can provide. And obviously, they're going to focus on the ones that can, can make them a lot of money. And they'll focus on the areas where it has a pr profitable market. And you can bet your bottom line they're not going to focus on rural remote areas. They're not going to focus on mental health or on homelessness. 
So you ask yourself, what is the end game about those proponents that are pushing the market in healthcare and saying that we can't afford public healthcare? The end game was described by this great economist at UBC in Vancouver, Bob Evans. And here it is in a nutshell. Here's their bottom line. The elite want access to the best healthcare money can buy without having to pay the taxes needed to provide equal access to care for everybody. That's the bottom line. But you get, of course, private financing offers the wealthy more for less and offers the rest of us less for more. And so this is at the bottom of the line, at the bottom of the, of the day, really a question of justice and fairness. This is a very serious time because while there's two proponents, they're not actually equally uh, financed in terms of getting their message out. The people pushing private health care actually happen to own most of the means of communication. They're basically on a, on a mission to say that Canada can't afford health care. I was at a, a think tank or a private sector consultation, a group called Canada 2020. I'd never really heard of them before, but they had Michael Kirby up there. And wherever he speaks, I kind of watch and listen because you have to know what he, he and his business groups are up to in healthcare. He gave a slide presentation and his slide said this, the top challenge facing Canada's healthcare system, quote, Convincing Canadians that the healthcare system is not financially sustainable. That's a very revealing sentence. He didn't say it's not sustainable. He said the challenge is to have us believe it's not. Have to, how do you convince people that it's not? In order to take away something from them that works, that's popular, that they want, and that they are prepared to fight for. So yes, it actually is a challenge for the privatizers and the Michael Kirby's of the world. So to do that, they're getting advice from people like Preston Manning. Do you remember Preston Manning? He said in a closed door meeting that they had to win the battle over language, the people that want to break Medicare. Rearrange the terms so that what appears moderate today is redefined as extreme and what appears as extreme is recast as moderate. Then they will be politically easier to completely dismantle National Medicare. This is a direct quote from Preston Manning. His, his agenda is to completely dismantle National Medicare. And he's saying the best place to start is in the province of Quebec. So this is a very serious concerted plan to break Medicare. And it's a strategic moment for us, as we know, because we've got a majority government in Ottawa who's actually, at least historically, very disposed to this ideology of breaking Medicare. So they speak in code, in a language deliberately des designed to deceive. So what we did a, on the Canadian Health Coalition website is we put together a decoder. Get your decoder. Because these people speak in code. It's amazing. But the thing is, what's empowering about getting a decoder is that once you unpack what their buzzwords are, you got them on the run. And it, and it won't deceive the public anymore. For example, sustainability is a really popular code word that you hear now. But what they really mean, you know, sustainability is a strange word when they say, healthcare is not sustainable. That's like saying, um, Caring for your loved one and, and love in society is not sustainable. Really? What is that saying? Health care? Care for the sick is not sustainable in the richest country in the world? What, what, what kind of a statement is that? And of course, what they really mean is it's not financially sustainable if you keep getting rid of taxes, if you completely dismantle the, the, the government's ability to raise revenues, then, of course, eventually, they won't be able to pay the bills in terms of running these programs. So we really need to, to decode the claim, then, that Medicare, public health care, is fiscally unsustainable, is, uh, and that the solution is to shift to more private health care, is a lie. And we should, and this is, this is a really pernicious lie because it's constantly being repeated 
uh, that healthcare is not sustainable. But in, but in fact, the only thing that is sustainable is the public insurance plans. It's the private plans that are going out of control. And as you know, in terms of your health benefit plans, they're going up 15% a year. Uh, because private insurance companies have no incentive to control costs. And we know, of course, that the, the pharmaceutical industry is, is gouging and is getting enormous profits. So we're gearing up for the review of the, of the health accord and for the negotiations around the, the renewal of the health accord. It's really important to realize that when you review the 2004 health accord, what, 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 what did we get in exchange for that major federal reinvestment in health care? It's really important to remember that because of that massive reinvestment, the system was stabilized because of those, that $40 billion put back in after those really deep cuts, uh, starting with Paul Martin in 1995. There's also been significant reductions in wait times. There's been a lot of innovation in the public sector to better manage wait times and to better integrate medical specialists within the healthcare system by getting them to work in teams across the spectrum. So there's a lot of, it, there's a lot of progress that has been made but I want to talk tonight about a couple of themes that really worry me. From where I stand at a federal level, our job is to look after and to, or rather to, to guard the federal government's responsibility. So I'm not going to speak about provincial government role. I'm looking at the federal government role in healthcare. And I, I'm really shocked at how they've withdrawn from a lot of their responsibilities in healthcare. The, um, there's really a deficit of political leadership in healthcare at the federal level. The Harper government never misses an opportunity to say that healthcare is a provincial responsibility and avoid accountability for their own responsibilities. You know, it's interesting. I started looking at and I actually made a list of what are the federal responsibilities in healthcare. Well, the federal minister of health has 12,000 people working for her with a $4 billion budget. And all she can say is, I have nothing to do in healthcare, it's provincial. That's a strange narrative. Uh, they have a lot of responsibility. She's responsible for the health of Canadians. That's a big job. And it includes drug safety, food safety. It includes a lot of environmental issues in terms of, of air quality and water. Obviously, they're responsible for delivering directly services to First Nations and Inuit. They also are responsible to enforce the Canada Health Act so that people do have access without extra billing, without user fees, and without queue jumping. And of course, we've seen the federal government actually not enforce the, the, uh, the Canada Health Act and not to be the guardian of provinces that are, that are allowing doctors to break the law. The other thing that we're missing at the federal scene is coordination. You can't have national human health resource strategy, for example, so that three or four provinces really work on, on critical shortages in, in the labor force, only to have other provinces poach them. Isn't that why we have a federal government? For national coordination? So there's a whole theme here in terms of the federal government not living up to its responsibilities to be the national coordinator in healthcare. And it's really critical I just want to take a couple of minutes for, I think, the most important piece in the 2004 accord that was dropped off the table by the federal government, which I think has to be brought back as the linchpin for a renewed health accord in 2014. And that is what was called the National Pharmaceutical Strategy. That was an 11 point of strategy agreed to, signed by all the first ministers. And then we had the spectacle a couple of years later of the health minister in the, in the House of Commons saying that there actually never was an agreement. That's, that's shocking, that, that level of trying to rewrite history. Uh, let me just go over some of the consequences of the Harper government walking away from the National Pharmaceutical Strategy. First, the inappropriate use of pharmaceuticals in Canada continues to be a leading cause of death because of lack of proper management of drugs. Second, eight million Canadians continue to suffer because of lack of affordable access to medicine, because they're either uninsured or underinsured. 
third prescription drugs in Canada, 30% more expensive than the international average. Fourth, rather than accelerate access to generic drugs, which was in the agreement, the Harper government is now secretly negotiating a deal with the European Union to drive up the costs of brand name prescription drugs by another $3 billion. So not only are they not implementing the agreement they signed, they're sabotaging it point by point. The fifth, rather than strengthen drug safety, Health Canada now has new legislation in the pipeline to weaken food safety regulation. And six, rather than take action to improve the prescribing, prescribing behavior of healthcare professionals, the federal government fuels inappropriate prescribing by allowing illegal direct-to-consumer advertising and off-label promotion. Do you realize that doctors are promoting illegally the use of extremely dangerous antidepressants in seniors in nursing homes? And with children as young as two years old. This is a crime. This is shocking. The federal government is turning the other way and is in fact enabling this kind of unbelievable behavior. This is, uh, this is a, a medical system out of control in terms of the, of the prescribing of drugs and the marketing machine behind the prescribing of drugs. Can you imagine targeting two-year-olds? And of course, just this week, there's a me the radio and the media is going on about kids need more Ritalin. We should start before they go to school. I think preschoolers should be drugged, don't you? This is insane. The, the, the drugging of our children, the drugging of our seniors. Why? Because we don't want to pay for health care. We don't want to pay for nursing staff and for professionals to work in nursing homes. So we drug the residents. What does that say about a society that treats its elders that way? Or that treats its children that way? So do we need a national strategy to deal with the pharmaceutical industry? I think so. And there's huge consequences. In fact, I think that it's impossible to have real health care reform without getting the pharmaceutical system under control and without serious public management of the pharmaceuticals. The Canadian Health Coalition commissioned a study a couple of years ago on how we would fund a national pharma care plan. And when we asked this young economist from Montreal to do it, we thought he'd give us a price tag. Instead, he came up with a study called The Economic Case for Pharmacare, and he said, you know, this would save $12 billion. It would save billions of dollars and save thousands of lives. And of course, he itemized how you would save that money. And part of it, of course, is having a national bulk purchasing strategy. So you don't leave it to every single province to negotiate with giant multinational companies. But you also eliminate the massive multi-billion dollar subsidies to the pharmaceutical industry. Do you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry is getting about twice as much in subsidies as they give back in economic activity. That's called a failed industrial strategy. We're paying 30% more than the international average, and the industry rewards us by closing down its research facilities. We're getting taken to the cleaners by the drug industry. So with this kind of research, politicians, especially at the federal level, can no longer say they can't afford pharmacare, a universal plan, because it actually would save money and be a much more rational approach to health care. And of course, we, we are preparing a full uh, brief and a full set of demands for the federal government going into these negotiations. And I'll just briefly summarize that, uh, and then we can get to some discussion. Um, one of the key ones, of course, is to stabilize the transfer in, in a renewed accord. We want it to be a 10-year accord because there's, there's been rumors that the Tories may try, first, if they could get away with it, have no accord, or a two-year accord, or a series of bilaterals with province by province. We need to head that off at the pass. Work with uh, like-minded premiers, like the Premier of Nova Scotia and other premiers, including the Premier of Ontario, to really push back. Provinces need to work together knowing they have a federal partner who doesn't want to lead in health care. So it's really important to develop a provincial consensus that there has to be a long-term plan 
so that provinces can adequately plan for the future because we have some serious challenges in our healthcare system. And what the last thing we need is to be worried about financing from Ottawa. That should be long term and it should be adequate and obviously include the 6% escalator. 6% escalator is not a lot of money. When you consider the population is growing and there's inflation and of course there's also um, Serious challenges with an aging population, too, in terms of home care and, and pharma care. So we're developing these, these demands, and we will also include a national pharma care plan and national, a national standards for a home and continuing care plan. That that is the role of the federal government, is to bring in national standards. The other thing that Health Coalition is doing in the lead up to these negotiations is organizing a major education session on Parliament Hill on November 30th. And that will start with basically a, a panel that we're inviting MPs and senators to. And this will be televised, and this will be live stream on our website, so every Canadian can see this. We're bringing in experts, including Roy Romano. And we're going to deal with the myths that people are being told that they can't afford health care. We're going to have those questions asked. We're going to have those questions discussed because it's an education for a lot of new MPs and a lot of the government. Um, so that's November 30th. There's, there's, uh, there'll be information at, on, out on the table uh, more on this event. It's called Secure the Future of Medicare, a Call to Care. Then when people, we're bringing in people from across Canada, so the Nova Scotia Citizens Action Network will be participating and, and all of our uh, coalitions across the country and other national organizations will be sending delegates to stay for that conference, but then to stay the next day and, and lobby MPs. So we have asked for a meeting with every federal member of parliament. And we're going to go in, and we're going to deal with the misinformation out there about health care, about how, in fact, it is sustainable, and that the only way to sustain it is to expand the public system. And we will be seeking their support for the leadership required to renew the, the health accord in 2014. We've prepared a series of questions and answers with the popular questions that are on people's minds, very often misleading, and we prepare the simple answers. So those are all materials that are available, will be available on our website so that you can, the public can access them and set up meetings as well in, their, in the ridings in, the, in their constituency with their MPs because the thing going into this negotiation is that we have the evidence on our side that Medicare works. It's interesting, even Conrad Black, now that he has some time on his hands, is he's writing some very interesting articles where he observed that the challenge of Obama and the United States on health care is so enormous. He said, he put a dollar figure on it, and Conrad Black said, the Americans would have to take $4,000 per capita from the medical industrial complex, from for-profit hospitals, from the insurance companies, from the, the um, uh, pharmaceutical industry. $4,000 per head, that's a lot of money if you multiply that by 300 million people. So what a mess they're in. Once you open the door per, to private for-profit provision, you'll never get Medicare back because we know that that then opens up those services to the international trade rules. So there are many people in this new world of the trade agreements that have concluded that if we didn't have Medicare before, we'd never get it now. So let's not trade it away and let's not open it up to privatization. I want to close with some words from Tommy Douglas. He said this in 1979. Tommy Douglas was at the founding of the Canadian Health Coalition meeting in 1979 with Justice Emmett Hall and Minig Beijing. And Tommy Douglas said at that time in 1979, we're proud of Medicare, but in the world you never stand still. You either go forward or you go backwards. And now we're going backward. Medicare is being eroded. Medicare is being weakened. And I warn you tonight that unless you stop this erosion, the Medicare will eventually be destroyed. The federal government ought to be giving some leadership in the matter. The federal government ought to be extending Medicare, 
not allowing it to be sabotaged. It's not enough to say something must be done. It's not enough to say we don't want to lose Medicare. What I want to know tonight is what we're going to do, what are you prepared to do about it to save it? We need to make the governments in this country sit up and listen. And we're going to tell them that our parents and our grandparents worked and fought and suffered to get us Medicare. And we're not going to let anyone take it away. So I encourage you to get active, to join the coalition, the Nova Scotia coalition and, and, and right across the country in pushing back, at our, especially at the federal politicians. We also have to meet the provincial politicians. And if the Harper government doesn't see the light, make sure they feel the heat. Thank you. Uh, Mike said he would uh, do some Q&A if anybody has something that we'd like to raise or question. Or Now there's a surprise. <laughs> uh, Kyle Buett, uh, CAW 4606. Um, I'm going to put my employer's hat on for a moment and jump back into my role at the Nova Scotia Citizens Healthcare Network. Thank you so much, Mike, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to distribute some materials both from the Canadian Health Coalition and from the Nova Scotia Citizens Healthcare Network about 2014. Um, some of the information that Mike has raised is available on the national website, which is healthcoalition.ca. This will give you all the information you need for that. Um, also, folks will be able to hear Mike and other of our affiliate leaders back here in November. On November 24th and 25th, the provincial health ministers are meeting here in Nova Scotia, in Halifax. Um, there's a letter that's gone out to all of your affiliate leaders as of Friday, giving you details when rallies, town halls, and uh, meetings are going to be held there. And Mike will be back uh, to speak at our press conference on the 24th as well. So thank you very much, Mike. I'm going to start destroying materials. Thanks very much, Kyle. See the number uh, four. Okay. Sounds like golf. <laughs> Microphone four, please. Gina B. Uh, Gina Boyd, CEP Local 165, and I'm an employee relations officer within the healthcare um, group within the province. I'd like to ask uh, your opinion and your position on government's use of wait time data. Um, I have made your concern. Um, as a Nova Scotian in the way that that data is provided to our government and posted publicly for the public to see. A lot of um, consumers are not aware that um, wait time standards are not a clear cut. They're based on the standards of care within that particular service, whether it be mental health, whether it be long-term care, and there's a large portion of that data that is cut and removed before they ever look at the average norm. So to give you an example, in addictions for adolescents, there's no standard set out for emergency. So therefore, um, a child that's in trouble with an addiction will go into the regular measurement, which right now stands at 60 days. You as consumers wouldn't be aware of that. If you are waiting to see a gerontologist and the wait time average is 45 or 60 days and you happen to pass away during that time period or there's a snowstorm and your appointment is canceled, um, your data for that wait time is not, um, not included. And so I think that the, the polished, nice statistical numbers that are provided to our government to make decisions on, um, we as a labor movement and healthcare coalitions, we need to start dissecting those wait times and showing the public truly that it, it's no more than a statistic that can be polished up to um, allow for their agenda. Yes, th um, thank you for that. That's a really important observation. When the um, federal government focused on wait times, we were really, really disappointed because they basically shelved the Romano report and went into what I thought was a gimmick. They picked five procedures 
which affected uh, aging male politicians most. Um, and so it was politically, politically gimmicky to focus on those five limited procedures. Whereas, what about the whole system? What about the big picture? What about everything in, in context? No, no, let's, let's just pick here and there to make ourselves look good. So I think it was a flawed strategy to begin with. And uh, there were a lot of critiques, including from Dr. Brian Postel, who was the federal wait time advisor, saying that you should not be picking and choosing uh, just, just procedures for aging boomers. What about children? You're, they were basically playing politics with the way you should run a healthcare system. And I agree with you that the ways are infinite to manipulate waiting lists. Uh, it's a mugs game, really. But I think overall there is more progress being made in terms of increasingly we're becoming aware of the games that can get played and how to stop the games. For example, prior to a lot of this attention on wait times, most Canadians didn't realize where the orthopedic surgeons kept their wait lists. <laughs> Do you know where they kept them? Locked in their desk. Can you imagine the ability to sabotage a healthcare system? And believe me, the orthopedic surgeons were sabotaging Medicare for their own personal interests. So what many provinces started to do was to train our, our orthopedic surgeons because they needed a culture shift. They needed to learn how to work in a team. So you share your list with us and then we ration the, the number of surgeons and, the, and the, the capacities we have and all of a sudden a lot of that backlog got cleared. So there is, I think, a lot of serious progress being made. There's a lot more things that need to be done and a lot more transparency and, and a lot more uh, integrity in the methods used. Uh, recently, I think it was in the last two weeks, there was some discussion on how uh, a number of our, our industry for bottling or carbonated drinks or whatever, all of a sudden it's some of the limits on caffeine have been taken away and yet the government, government comes out, Health Canada again, and says we want to reduce the amount or warnings or whatever for certain types of, car I don't know, like Red Bull and things like that. I mean, they're obviously playing a lot of games and it's not obviously showing. I mean, can, I, I don't know whether you have heard any more initiatives of, of that like. When you said talking about food safety and a number of things, this would be some of the tactics, I would say. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. That was really outrageous, that, that whole decision that the health minister made around that, uh, the, those drinks with the heavy caffeine in them. Um, because the, the department had a panel of experts say that they should be, they're a drug and should be treated as such at a drugstore, not, not in a grocery store. So she took that, put it in the garbage, and sat down with the industry and gave them what they wanted, basically. Um, because international trade comes before health in Canada. And, and you know what, it's not just the Conservative government. The Liberals were the same. And, and, and so, this takes people power to change. This is not a partisan political thing. This is a cultural thing. And this is about power. This has to change. But, it, it, but we have a big challenge in terms of, it's not a, easy to find a, a party that's obviously or quickly gonna change it. They can't change it unless people insist it get changed. Um, it's interesting, we asked for a meeting with this minister when she first got uh, sworn in and, and when she was reelected. So we're gonna put a clock on our website. A number of days we've been waiting to get a meeting with the Minister of Health, because uh, she said she won't meet with us. So we tracked who she's been meeting with. I can bet you, I can show you that she's been meeting with the beverage industry before that decision. I mean, this is the Minister for, for Corporations, Food and Drug Industry, basically, uh, and Health, Health is an afterthought. So that is a real serious problem. Because, see, there's another flaw in terms of the federal role in health care. How can provinces be treating us when the feds are making us sick? Federal policy is making us sick in terms of the kind of uh, 
adulteration that's going on in the food system, making people sick, and then dumping the bills on provinces and, and, and everyone else and individuals to, to pay for that, 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 prevent, that, that, that illness which was preventative. Uh, so there's another, so if the federal government doesn't perform its regulatory duties properly, there's no healthcare system in the world is ever going to be able to keep up with that kind of failure. Uh, Joan Jessam, uh, uh, President of NSG, first Vice President of the Federation of Labor. Can everybody hear me? This mic is really low. Um, first of all, Mike, I want to thank you for your role in, in the Medicare. You're our today's uh, Tommy Douglas. I mean, you're the President Tommy Douglas for us, and in, in how you advocate on behalf of public health care all the time. And I really appreciate the knowledge that you shared with us tonight. We, in our union and in the other healthcare unions, we have um, very, very active in the Nova Scotia Citizens Healthcare Network, both not just physically, but funding it as, as well. And I would challenge all unions that are here to look at making the donations to the healthcare network so that we have the funding to go forward because we're up against probably, and I'm telling my members when I'm going around the province that, you know, we can go to the bargaining table, but this will be the biggest fight of our lives is protecting our med public health care. And in the states, when you negotiate and you don't have public health care, you're negotiating $17, $18 more an hour so that they can afford to insure themselves. So it is a huge issue here. And yes, we have a labor-friendly government, and we most likely will get first contract language in, in November. But this government just recently put out an RFP and looking for a tender to get uh, companies to come in and give them different options on shared services. They identified 13 services. This company is supposed to come back within a couple of weeks and give them, three months actually, and give them no less than, no more than six of those 13 services of what should be done with them. And one of the options, in fact, two of them, one is almost like a P3 model, and the other is the ASD, the Alternative Service Delivery. And I, we've had our battles, believe me, we've had our words with this Minister of Health and with the Premier. And they say, well, you know, our philosophy is not to privatize. My concern is that, first of all, they've drank the Kool-Aid. And now that they have put an RFP out there, and Ernst Young is the company that got the contract. Ernst Young, if you go on his website, their website, they're international. They will coach employers how to privatize health care and enter into P3. They will help you write the contract. And we have an NDP labor government that are supposed to stand for public health care, deliver publicly, funded publicly, have gone out and have hired a company, and first of all, and, and they're notorious, not, governments are notorious for hiring consultants to tell them, well, we all know what should be done. And one of, the, one of those options are to, to look at these 13 services and find out if there's can be one be done or delivered in an alternative way. And they say, well, don't, you know, that's not our philosophy. But what we will live with in the labor movement and representing healthcare workers in this province is that a labor-friendly government did an RFP and put the option of privatization on that RFP. So whether they ever enact on it or not, that report will be haunting us, biting at our heels for as long as we are here in this province. And I find it disgraceful and inappropriate for this government to be looking at that and have that's going to come back. I can guarantee you it's going to come back at us. And here we, so we have, and I don't, so many people think that this isn't their fight. And there isn't a single person that there isn't, that this isn't their fight. We talk nationally about all the things that we're going to look at as of national programs. And I think, you know, in, in my job and what I come across uh, pretty much on a regular daily occurrence is mental health in the workplace. And there's no national mental health strategy. And it's at an epidemic proportion, the issues around mental health and productivity, lost time, our people are sick, the services aren't there and it's costing $51 billion a year in lost productivity and time to the workplace. You can imagine if you had that kind of money to invest back into the workplace on a mental health strategy. It, it, it's, it'll, and there's no talk about it. There's no talk about really nationally. Is when we talk about renegotiating the accord, there isn't a single person, no matter how old you are, that mental health will not touch at some point in your life. And I think we really nationally have to put that on the agenda and keep it there and take it out of its darkness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joan, for your kind words and, and you brought up some really important issues. I, if there's anything we can do at the national level to help bring in 
the evidence about why it's so dangerous to be talking alternative service delivery. Because uh, there has been good examples where we, we did bring in outside experts to New Brunswick and turned it around. Uh, there's been reversals made in other provinces where they tried to go there, whether it was Manitoba or elsewhere. Uh, so hopefully the door's open that they will listen to some, out, some, some experts at least. Uh, because that's like a virus. It has to be nipped in the bud. Because that will grow and do a lot of damage. So I'm really glad you're, you're on to that and on top of that. Um, I brought a poster with me here and it kind of summarizes a lot of things. Because I don't want people to feel discouraged. And that's why we put out a poster about 10 years ago called Snakes and Ladders. Because this really summarizes the dynamic, the political dynamic. <laughs> the first square, I think it was around 1670 when the first prepaid health care came in in Montreal between the nuns and a couple of surgeons. And you'll see, of course, this is the way history works. You've got progress when people come together in a team. That's a ladder. People get around a kitchen table in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, and decide they've got to insure themselves because they can't afford health care. That's, that's a ladder. That didn't come from the corporate boardrooms. People get together, that's a ladder. They build. Of course, there's also snakes, people that are trying to take away social programs to, for private profit. And so that's the history of basic, that's the history of healthcare since before the country was really a country. So we, we have an historical context in our battles. So don't get discouraged in terms of this week, uh, this year, this decade. Th this, is, this is the way history is, that in terms of we struggle together to build the ladders and to avoid the snakes. And uh, I, I just really think that it's good to have an historical context for our work and, and to uh, keep building on the generations that have done so much before us. Hey, I see no one else. Uh, like I really want to thank you too on behalf of the of the convention, but all Nova Scotians for the role you are playing in healthcare. Uh, I think Joan put it quite well. Your your this area is Tommy Douglas. Uh, we've got major struggles. Uh, uh, we've had that debate with with the government about uh, about getting that study done and and, and the possibility of, of uh, private uh, uh, delivery of services. Uh, and and I agree with Joan. It's when uh, they did say that uh, it's you know the, their philosophy is not to. But once that, that seed is planted, uh, this government could be gone, and it's going to come back to haunt us with another one. So we have to fight to make sure that it never gets out. So uh, we probably will, when the consultation comes up, uh, take you up on that offer. Uh, and I would encourage everyone, too, that we do have an, an excellent Nova Scotia Health Care Coalition uh, that Joan mentioned and, and Kyle had talked about uh, to get out and support it. We did all increase all the partners to it, increase the financing to it uh, within the last uh, few months uh, to ensure that uh, we're able to take on the challenges, and we have some very serious challenges. We have the health accord, uh, but we also have the, this government, this federal government, uh, does not have designated targeting for for the transfer payments, and 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 we're very afraid what's going to happen with the transfer payments. Not only this province, but others, uh, 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 seeing where this uh, majority government federally is going. So we've got to struggle, and I, I think that I, I just want to, in thanking you, uh, to say that we're we're there. Uh, we're up for the challenge, and uh, certainly we'll, we'll stand with, side by side with the health coalitions as, as we fight for fairness and maintain our health care in this country. Thank you very much. And, and I believe it, it just seems natural that uh, the, the nonprofit group that we'll be making the donation to in Mike's behalf is the Canadian Health Coalition. <laughs>